coming up towards 18 minutes after 6 o'clock in Trinidad and Tobago. Good to have you with us on this Wednesday in the middle of your business. Well, let's deal with the issue of the Port of Port of Spain because consultations have begun on the privatization of the port by the cabinet appointed committee. Remember, this was announced on October the 5th uh, by uh, the finance minister. Well, a brief update was given to the public on Friday in a media conference. One of the main objectives is to turn the port into a profitable entity. There have been mixed reactions since the announcement in the budget and indeed uh, the, uh, the representative union uh, would have already expressed uh, their concerns. Uh, we're joined <coughs> now by the Works and Transport Minister, Rohan Sinanan. Minister, very good morning to you. Thanks uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, always a lot of issues on the table when we talk about uh, issues under uh, your, your purview as Minister of Works and Transport. But let's deal with the issue of the privatization of the port. Where are we at in the process right now? Good morning to you. Good morning, Fazir. Good morning, Fernando and Tobago. Fazir, and I agree with you, the Ministry of Works and Transport is definitely one of the larger ministries in Trinidad and Tobago. And obviously, you will have a lot of uh, activities taking place. Remember, we, we are in charge basically of the infrastructure and the transportation, which includes the airport, ports, um, the PTSC services, civil aviation, national helicopters. And you know, we have the, the different divisions within the ministry, coastal, um, the highways division, the drainage division. So we always do have um, our fair share of uh, activities taking place. And because we interact with the, the population on a daily basis, including the license office, you know, we will always be, you know, highlighted on your program and several other programs in Trinidad. Let's talk about the port, where we are with the port. You recognize since 2002, a decision was taken for uh, getting the port of port of spain uh, up to uh, imp a significant improvement in terms of the, the the ability of the port to deal with one its cargo handling service the, the tobago ferry service and also its land management three companies were set up in 2002. Um, subsequent to that uh, management company came in in 2007 they operated until 2011. all this in trying to get the port to a position where we can continue to be the number one port in the Caribbean. Unfortunately, all those uh, programs and processes would have fallen for several reasons. The government took a decision as far back as 2015, it was in the PNM Manifesto, to get the port of Port of Spain up to an international standard in terms of its the, the serving the population of Trinidad and Tobago and being able to attract vessels and cargo from around the world. We went out for uh, some consultations. Uh, we, we got the IDB involved in 2018. And in 2019, the IDB submitted to us a report on basically the, the conditions of the port in Trinidad and the way forward for us. The government took a decision recently, the cabinet took a decision recently that it, you know, we need to act now on the port because what has been happening over the last couple of years basically is that our port would have been, you know, we were rated number one in the Caribbean. Unfortunately, because of, and I must say a lack of, of, of the capital input, because of several reasons, our port would have slipped significantly on that marker. The cabinet took that decision that we had to, to optimize the, the port in Port of Spain and put together a committee headed by Ms. Allison West to look at several aspects of the port and report the cabinet. And I think it's December 15th, basically on the right model for a PPP at the port. Where we are at now, we are at the stage of having consultations with all the stakeholders and that committee, uh, we met last week, we are meeting today again with several stakeholders. And uh, once that consultation is completed, a report will be submitted to the cabinet forward.
We're just having some issues, Minister, with the reliability of your signal, but we're still hearing you. We, we can still see you uh, clearly now. But I just want to clarify, uh, just so we can understand, the report is supposed to be submitted by the committee headed by Minister Alison West on December the 15th. Uh, after yes. that, what happens? Well, after that, then the cabinet will take a decision um, on the way forward. So and once that report is submitted to the cabinet, the cabinet will take the decision on the way forward. Again, what we are looking at is the ideal model for the port of Port of Spain. Because there are several models. And if you look in terms of what is happening around the Caribbean, Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad is definitely one of the, the probably the, the only uh, port that does not have a, a private uh, injection and, or private management. Most of the ports around the world now have gone with different models that suits their their, their, their interests. So what we are at now is at, at, at least trying to identify a model that will be suitable for us here in Trinidad and Tobago. And then we will go out with that for uh, you know, a, a proper process to ensure that we, got, we get uh, the best person to work with us in Trinidad and Tobago. And, and obviously, Minister, you would be well aware of the responses of, of, of the union uh, representing workers on the port with their continued response. This is nothing new. They've said this over several administrations, that the issues on the port have to do more with mismanagement, political mismanagement, interference in the processes. And uh, the, the, the fact, Minister, that you would mention that this was on the table of a PNM administration since 2002, and now we're in mm -hmm. 2020. Isn't it the, the, the reality, Minister, that this has more to do with government not having the money to subsidize the inefficiencies at the port than with any real effort to give us an efficient port for the benefit of Trinidad and Tobago? Well, Fazir, we can, we can you know, make several assertions as to how we came here and why are we taking this decision. If we look for a price, the, the decision we have to make, do we continue with the port as it is? Could we afford to continue with the port as it is? The answer to that is no, for several reasons. Since the improvement of the Panama Canal, the vessels that would have normally visit Trinidad and Tobago, we have now much larger vessels coming out of the Panama Canal we do not have the facilities for those vessels. And what you find happening is that most of these shipping lines will bypass Trinidad. They will not even come down here. They will go to Jamaica. They will go to some of the, the ports that, that, that would have uh, invested heavily in their infrastructure. So if we want to continue to be a player in the transshipment uh, business, we have to have a significant financial injection into the port. I, I hear you on that, is Minister, it, but do you anticipate, is, if you would allow me, do you anticipate resistance from the representative union in that regard? And is that going to actually be your major stumbling block? Well, the unions are represented on the committee formed by the cabinet. I do not see any major pushback by the unions. I think um, I don't want to comment on the consultations because we do have a chairman and, and at the appropriate time, the chairman will comment on the consultations. But where I sit and I have been dealing with the unions for quite a while, I think the unions are all on board with the private, well, with the looking for a new model and, a, and private injection into the port. Uh, but obviously the unions will have their interests that they will want to ensure that their workers are, you know, have, have I've gotten, uh, I should say, we should take care of the, the, the employees in, in a manner that is in keeping with good industrial relations. And so um, I don't see a challenge coming from the union because the unions have also recognized and they have made it quite clear that the, the, the port has to be upgraded. There has to be a capital injection into the port and a new model for the port of Port of Spain has to be achieved if the port has to survive. I think the unions came out some time ago and indicated that, you know, the, the port basically was overstaffed and they recognized that the working practices of the port are outdated. So I don't see any pushback from the union in terms of us going forward. I mean, obviously the union will have to, to, to you know, make negotiations for the employee and, and the government is open to, to, to listening and, and to ensure that Nobody is left behind. 
And, and I, I take the point that you're making, Minister, about, you know, you're, you're highlighting a lot of the, the issues and the challenges. In fact, the Prime Minister talked about it uh, three, four years ago, about the opening up of the Panama Canal and the opportunities for Trinidad and Tobago. We've lost those opportunities to Kingston, uh, Jamaica, and so on. And, and that's where the, the, the concern comes in, Minister. What confidence can be reposed in your administration, given that all of the signs were there, that we should have been doing this years ago. And therefore, that's why I'm posing the question this way. If it is that you couldn't do it then, with all the mm -hmm. evidence in front of us, why should the, the, the people of Trinidad and Tobago believe that the administration of which you are a part can do this effectively and efficiently now? You see, that, that, that question could, could tend to be a, 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 a political question, and I'll give it a political answer. I think it is only this government that can take that decision and ensure that it happens. Because it was 2002, as I said, that this started, this process started. Unfortunately, and I agree with you, one of the, 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 the advantages of having a, a, a PPP is that you have improved government governance at the port, and then you have a, re a reduction in government interference at the port. Look at what is happening at Pibdeco. And you compare Pibdeco to the port of Port of Spain, a much smaller port, but I must say a more or, or equally efficiently run port, but they actually declare a significant profit on an annual basis. So why it wasn't done it before? There are several reasons for that. What I can say is that this government has taken a decision, and this government has been tasked with making some harsh decisions. But we make the right decisions in the interest of Trinidad and Tobago. And why not before? I can't answer that. What I can tell you is that this cabinet has taken a decision that the port of Port of Spain, now is the time for the port of Port of Spain to be a much more attractive port to the liners, the ship lines, and also to, to be able to compete with the ports in the Caribbean. And because, because we do have one of the best locations in the Caribbean. And, and because we're talking about competition, and w at this point as we speak, we are losing ground, we are losing business to Kingston and maybe some other ports up and down the Caribbean. Uh, if we're talking about timelines, and I appreciate the point that you're making about consultation, due process, and so on, but we, we're seeing what is happening with the patriotic energy situation. One minute you hear that it's off, two days later you hear they have until the end of November, now we're hearing allegations, and again we could get into the politics about the, the billion dollar deal and, and all of that, but let's not go into that. But from your understanding of how a process like this works, what would be an ideal finishing point where you could say, okay, we have, a, we have an agreement signed and sealed with XYZ company to run the port of Port of Spain. Are we talking 2021, 2022? What sort of timeline do you have in mind? Well, we do have a mandate from the cabinet at the Ministry of Works. We have a one-year mandate. And as I said, this committee has to report back to cabinet on the 15th of December. So, I mean, when you look in terms of finding a, 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 an appropriate model, a PPP model for the port, this is not something that you can just go out on a shelf and just, you know, and, and pick up. It has a lot of negotiations in it. Again, we have to find the right model to suit Trinidad and Tobago. But what I'm, I'm, I'm really comforted in the fact with all the consultations that we have had so far, I have heard nobody say that we are on the wrong track. So far, we have met with about eight different stakeholder groups. Today, I think we're meeting with a, a, a further six, and we continue to meet with the stakeholder group. As a matter of fact, there's so much interest that we may have to put another consultation meeting. But I have heard no one said that we, the government is on the wrong track. I think everybody so far have welcomed this move by the government, and they are all willing to do their part to ensure that you know we work as a team, as a unit, and our port at Port of Spain reclaim that position of being the number one port in the Caribbean. And of course, this is an ongoing dis the discussion, and we will keep in mind that date of December the 15th. And as, as we, we agreed, Minister, there are so many issues on the table when you talk about your ministry and your portfolio, that there are many issues on the table. We actually had the maxi-taxis, the, the Route 2 maxi-taxis, 
uh, staging a protest on Monday out, outside the ministry's, ministry's office. Uh, the issue, they're claiming corruption in the awarding of, of, of badges to use the, the priority bus route and so on. Uh, what is your perspective on that situation? Uh, let me clarify a statement. That there was no protest by the U2 Maxi Taxi Association. There was a protest by a group of Maxi Taxi owners. I have been in contact with the Group 2 Maxi Taxi Association and the administration, and I spoke to the president, and he is not in support of what is happening there. As a matter of fact, Fazir, the Maxi Taxi uh, passes for the bus route is governed by a limited amount, 1150. There's a system you know, that, that is in place in order for you to, to get one of these passes. 1150 passes have been allocated. They're, because of the demand for passes, we create a list, a waiting list, and you are only allowed a pass based on your number on that list. From time to time, the ministry, as we are doing right now, we will go revisit the list because we do have a re-registration re process. And because of the COVID this year, we allow the maxi taxis to bypass that registration every six months. During that process, we will identify dormant passes. And these dormant passes will be issued, reissued to the persons on the waiting list. These persons on the waiting list based on the number that they hold what we have happening now there are some members who are way down on that list and are trying to put pressure on the ministry by ma making allegations without any proof on the staff at the ministry in order for them to be bumped up on the list that will not happen as a matter of fact today the maxi taxi advisory committee which comprises of the president of the maxi taxi association and the president of the Route 2 Maxi Taxi Association and several uh, members of the ministry, including the permanent secretary, they are meeting today and they have actually called in one of the main spokespersons for this minority group to come to the ministry and lay his claim. And I'm hoping that he will come in and state his claim, state whatever proof he has on the staff of the ministry. And then hopefully at the end of that meeting, he will recognize that he's wrong and he's spreading false information on the hardworking technocrats at the ministry. All right. Well, th thanks That's very much for I taking the time uh, to, to clarify that. And you, you have a barking dog in the background, clearly supporting you uh, in, in that regard as well. But, <laughs> but, 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 Minister, we have, we have Thank less... Thank you. Sorry for that for the year. That's, that's fine. We have, we, have less, uh, we have the birds as well to keep us company also, which is a nice, nice background sound also. But we have less than five minutes uh, to go in our discussion, Minister. And you know, it's, it's always important when we can give you practical examples of when things sure. aren't working, uh, to, to just give you a sense. And I'm sure you, you would be aware of certain situations. And we talk about a, a government that has trumpeted the cause of digitization and ease of doing business. Could I reference the inter-island ferry service? And we're anticipating the, the two new boats coming in. We've seen the Australian cricketers based in Tasmania trumpeting the boat and so on that, that will be coming and so on. Uh, so we look forward to that. But the mere fact, Minister, that the inter-island ferry services ticketed system is no longer online. You can't purchase tickets online anymore. That you have to go into an office and as in the case in Port of Spain, wait two and a half hours to get tickets on the ferry. Doesn't that tell you, Minister, that the system is going backwards in that case instead of going forwards? Azir, this was not, this, this happened recently. The, the, the entire ticketing service, actually, you can, you could have gone to several franchises in Tobago and in Trinidad and purchased these tickets. Because of the COVID-19 situations, a lot of things had to change in Trinidad. And we had to limit the amount of passengers actually going on the vessels. What we had is a lot of passengers buying, uh, booking tickets and so, and then not using them. So the COVID would have put some damper on the systems that were in place before. But I don't see that as a major challenge. As a matter of fact, with technology now, and we do have, and I must uh, say, Mr. Cummings, 
who is in charge of the digitization of the entire Ministry of Works is looking at all the different aspects, including the port, including the license office, including all the, the, the entities under the ministry to ensure that we, we continue to, to you know, focus on the government policy of digitizing the entire government service. So yes, they do have some hiccups. I can say license office, they rolled out a brilliant IT plan. Unfortunately, because of the COVID-19, they had to go to appointments, which did put some strain on the system because we can't have too much gathering. Now that we are gradually coming back to some level of normalcy uh, based on um, guidelines from the Ministry of Health, we will see these practices going back in place and we not only getting back to where we were, but trying to achieve that level where you can actually stay on your phone and purchase tickets. Final point, Minister. Could I ask you, and we have just a couple of minutes left, what does COVID-19 have to do with an online, efficient online ticketing and appointment system? Because here, the, the system was not perfect. The system was not perfect. And what we found is that several people were blocking tickets. And, and it happens not only with, with the ferry service, but sometimes if you go to the airport, you realize that, look, um, all the flights are booked. But when you go on standby and you get on a flight, you realize half the flight is empty. They ask the system is not a perfect system. We are working on the system to get it perfect. Um, but I must say the COVID did put some strain on us. I, I mean, sometimes you see you, you have people showing up with tickets in hand, but we do have a limit as to the amount of people that can go on the boat. So there was some controls. This is something that happened to us overnight. But I'm sure that as we gradually get out of it, the system will start to function in a way that it was functioning before and an improved system because we are investing a lot of money into IT in, in the different areas of the ministry. And, and, and we are going to get that part of it correct. Sure. And so finally, how do you respond? If there are any um, inconveniences, unfortunately, we are in a situation where, you know, the, 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 the normal way that we do business has to change. And finally, and finally, Minister, and we appreciate you taking the time to be with us this morning. How do you respond to the assertion that these inefficiencies are merely there to facilitate corruption? So essentially, with all of the online thing, you still need to pass a few blue notes to get things done. Azir, I have been on record as saying that there are a lot of inefficiencies, and as some of the, 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 the members at, at the ministry, the staff at the ministry tried to justify to me when I told them blatantly that there was a lot of corruption in several aspects of the, the operations. They said it was unethical practices. I term it to be corruption. I totally agree with you. There are a lot of people who do not want the system to improve because they benefit from it as it is. But our job as a government is to fix that. And I can tell you that we are not going to, to leave any stone unturned. We are going to get to the bottom of it and we are going to minimize that. But we have to depend on the staff to do it. Unfortunately, a system is as good as the people who operate the system. And I am not going to sit here and say, no, there's no corruption in any aspect of government. We live in Trinidad and we cannot bury our head in the sand. But fortunately, we have a government in office who will do everything in its power to ensure that we minimize and eliminate this corrupt practices in any department where Minister, it exists. Minister, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us this morning. You could go ahead now and feed the birds and feed the dog and, and so on and show uh, the, 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 their appetites are properly sated as we head uh, deeper into the day. We want to thank the Minister uh, for joining us and let's remind you as we go to the